This spot in the Holy Land changed how I read the Bible. Not long ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Israel for the first time. Now, throughout my life, people had told me that Israel is the fifth gospel, right? It gives you an entirely new perspective on the Bible. But I'll be honest, I was skeptical. I wondered, would it live up to the hype? Well, this one spot not only met expectations, it exceeded them. I found myself in a place I never even thought existed. And so today, I'm going to share with you not just one, but five spots that changed how I see the Bible, and the last one is the best. So if you're interested in learning what these are, then join me for this episode of Misreading Scripture, and make sure to stick around until the end, where I will share with you how you can see these places for yourself on a special trip to Israel. In the 23rd Psalm, David says, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I used to read this verse, I interpreted it in a very spiritual way, right? I heard David saying that God is leading us to be more righteous. And there is a sense in which that is what David is saying, but there's also something else going on here. You see, paths of righteousness aren't just a spiritual practice. They're also a physical landmark. Paths of righteousness are the paths along the side of a mountain where the shepherd will lead his sheep. And you can actually see them lining the side of the mountains as you drive through the deserts of Israel. Well, when I was in Israel, we got off the bus one morning on the side of a mountain and we descended this steep hill composed of a bunch of loose rocks. With each step, I stumbled and fought to keep my balance. Until at one point, I saw a change in the landscape. In the midst of all of these loose rocks, there was a line that looked well-trodden. I mean, you could see that many people had walked this line before. And as soon as I stepped on it, everything changed. I mean, I didn't stumble. I didn't trip. Everything was different. And then I realized I was on the path of righteousness. And here's what's even more amazing. When a shepherd leads sheep along this path, the sheep don't even look up at the shepherd. Along these paths, there are green pastures, just little tufts of vegetation where the sheep can eat. As the shepherd leads, they follow, grazing as they move, never worrying about the jagged rocks and the steep cliffs below. In fact, they don't even follow the shepherd with their eyes. They follow the shepherd's voice. They trust their shepherd to lead them along these paths. Let me ask you, where do you need to follow the shepherd's voice in your life? Where do you need to trust the Lord and follow in obedience? Where have you been walking on loose rocks for too long, taking your own path and, and calling it freedom? But what you realize is that you just need to trust the Lord to lead you along the paths of righteousness. One day while we were in the Galilee region of Israel, we traveled to what was clearly the remains of an ancient Roman city. The markets lining the street, the well-paved roads going through the heart of the city, the abundance of intricate mosaics. All of these things made it clear that not only was this a Roman city, it was a wealthy Roman city. But then our guide showed us something amazing. He pointed to a hill off in the distance and he said, do you know what town that is? And as it turned out, it was Nazareth. And as he said that, some things began to click for me and I realized where we were standing. We were in the ancient Roman city of Sepphoris which was really exciting. You see, while most of us have never even heard of this city, it had a significant place in the life of Jesus. Around the time of Jesus' birth, there was an uprising in Sepphoris. Judas the Golanite captured the citadel and its weapons. And in response, the Roman general Varus destroyed the city, shipping thousands off to be slaves or even to be crucified. Now, at the very least, Joseph, Mary, and all the others in that region of the world would have witnessed this atrocity. But it's also likely that Joseph would have found work in its wake. Right? As a tecton, Joseph would likely have had opportunities to help rebuild this city after its destruction. And since it was traditional for sons to accompany an apprentice with their fathers, that means that Jesus would have been likely to go with Joseph as he completed these projects. Jesus would have been exposed to the culture and the practices of the people of Sephoris. 
He would have gotten a firsthand look at the Gentile culture. In fact, we even see evidence of this in one of Jesus' sayings. When Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. His words are incredibly similar to a line from a famous play at that time called The Trojan Women by Euripides. Perhaps this was a place showing in Sephoris while Jesus worked there with Joseph. Right? Or maybe Jesus heard people quoting this along the streets and remembered it years later. Whatever the case, as you walk these streets, you begin to realize how Jesus grew up in the midst of all of this. Sephoris is a prime example of the Roman culture that influenced so much of the first century world in which Jesus lived. And exposures like this were the first of many experiences that would bring Jesus together with Gentiles to whom, despite the expectations and desires of many, he would offer the same gift of salvation that he was bringing to his own people. On our very first day in the Holy Land, we were hiking through an area called the Shephelah. This is a flatter region in Israel where many of the major battles of the Bible took place, like the fight between David and Goliath. Well, as we began our journey that day, we quickly found ourselves among some ancient Canaanite ruins dating back thousands of years. You could easily see the entrance to this small city and foundations for some of its basic buildings. But then as we went further up the hill, we came to another set of ruins, this much bigger than the first. I mean, it was obvious that whatever this place was, it had been built up and fortified to secure the valley just outside of its walls. Which makes sense, because the place where we were standing was the ancient fortress city of Gezer. In 1 Kings, we learn that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer. He had set it on fire, he killed its Canaanite inhabitants, and then he gave it as a wedding gift to his daughter, Solomon's wife. That's where we were standing, in this city that Pharaoh had captured and given to Solomon as a wedding present. The ruins that we'd passed through were earlier structures belonging to the Canaanite inhabitants. I mean, this was no ordinary structure. It was one of the main defensive positions in Solomon's empire. But here's what made it even more amazing. In the midst of this major fortress, a famous structure focused on military defense, we found something very, very ordinary. A manger. Not what you expected, is it? Right? It's, it's not the wooden structure that we find in most of our nativity sets, it's stone. Which makes sense when you understand something about how people functioned at that time. You see, in general, animals weren't fed in the house. Right? There, there was no need for that. Outside, there were vast fields with vegetation. Mangers weren't so much feeding troughs as they were watering troughs. Right Now you can understand why they were made out of stone. Not only was stone far more abundant than wood, but stone doesn't leak. Right? The animals may have had an abundance of food out in the fields, but they may not have had a water source anywhere near them. So they would come and drink at the manger. As you're standing in these ruins, you can imagine how all of these things unfolded. You can imagine the major battles happening in the valley below, but you can also imagine everyday life. You can picture animals roaming around, families performing daily tasks. And now suddenly, Gezer simply isn't a word in the Bible that you just don't know how to pronounce. It's a place filled with life that leaps off the page and into your mind's eye. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And just make sure you stick around until the end so you can learn how you can experience this firsthand. Now, just as mangers weren't made of wood at the time of Jesus, Another thing you quickly learn as you're traveling through Israel is that houses weren't either. Right? Most of the time when we picture homes in the Holy Land, we picture stucco-like exteriors, right? They're, they're covered with a facade like this, but they're constructed of wood. But as soon as you enter the ruins of an ancient city, you notice that none of the houses were built like this, right? Maybe they had the facades on the outside, but every remaining foundation is one of stone. You see, at the time of Jesus, trees were not that abundant, right? There, there's been a resurgence in recent decades because of intentional efforts to plant trees throughout the country. But for most people at the time of Jesus, the most abundant resource would have been stone. Stone is everywhere. No matter where you walk, you can see stone protruding out of the soil. 
It was a natural, more stable resource for home building. But the reality of stone housing also changes another image in our minds when it comes to the life of Jesus. Carpenters. Right? Most of our Bibles record that Jesus' father, Joseph, was a carpenter. We assume Jesus was a carpenter, but that's probably not the most accurate translation. The actual Greek word that appears here is the word tecton. And while a tecton might do carpentry work, a more accurate translation of this word would be stonemason. This would be the primary work of a tecton. As Joseph helped to rebuild Sephoris, he would have been building stone buildings. As he constructed homes in Nazareth, they would have been built of stone. Stone masonry was exhausting, time-consuming work that required strength and patience. There was a lot of waiting around. And so as Jesus apprenticed with Joseph, he would have had lots of time to sit and discuss the scriptures, to learn the stories of Joseph's family, to talk through the things that he was witnessing in Sephoris. And as you look at things through this lens, you begin to notice all of this stone language that Jesus uses throughout the Gospels. Right? He grew up around this. His people grew up around this. It was the language that they knew, and it spoke to them in a way that becomes clear as you experience the land in which they lived. Perhaps the most amazing place I went in the Holy Land was a place called Gamla, which may actually sound strange at first. You see, one of the things you learn when you walk through the Holy Land is that so many places are filled with stories of tragedy. Over and over, you will hear stories of how thousands of people, men, women, and children, were slaughtered in this place and that place. And this is unfortunately the case in Gamla. Gamla was a zealot stronghold in the Golan Heights, an area not far from the, the Sea of Galilee. Zealots were a sect of Judaism who believed that the salvation of God's people rested in their ability to overthrow the Romans and remove them from the land. They resisted Roman laws, they attacked Roman officials, and eventually, they came face to face with the strength and the brutality of the Roman military machine. This is what happened at Gamla in 67 CE. At that time, the Roman army executed a siege against the fortified city, and they demolished it, massacring everyone. And when you know the stories you visit, it's a tough place to be. But in the midst of this tragic place, there was also something truly amazing. You see, in Gamla, there are some well-preserved ruins of a first-century synagogue. You can see the Bema, where a, a different person each week would give what we would describe as a mini-sermon. You can see the remains of the Torah closet, where the scriptures were held. Just outside of the synagogue is the mikvah, right, where people would ritually cleanse themselves before worship. But the most exciting part of the entire synagogue, for me, was the doorway, the threshold. You see, there's only one entrance into this synagogue. Everyone who entered had to cross over this threshold. Which is really exciting when you read a scripture like this that says Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Now notice what that says. Jesus went through all the towns and villages preaching in their synagogues. All of them. Which means that Jesus came to Gamla. Which means that Jesus preached in this synagogue. Which means that Jesus crossed this threshold. Which means that Jesus walked right here. Right? There are a lot of places in Israel where you think, Jesus was probably somewhere around here. But in a synagogue like Gamla, you know that Jesus stepped right here. I mean, you know I stepped on every inch of that threshold while I was there so that I could know that I had stepped where Jesus stepped, walked where Jesus walked. It's in a place like this that the scriptures begin to come to life. Suddenly, you can better imagine what it was like when Jesus preached in other synagogues, mentioned in other gospels. You can picture what his journeys were like. Little details begin to stand out, like the temperature, the terrain, the political climate in that place when Jesus preached there, the issues that they were grappling with. And when all of this happens, Scripture comes alive. I mean, this is why I am so passionate about giving people opportunities to experience this for themselves. Part of the mission of this channel is to bridge the gap between people and the land of the Bible. 
right? We do that through videos like this, where I try to bring the Holy Land to you. But I also want to give you an opportunity to go to the Holy Land. And if you're interested, I'd like for you to join me on a trip next February in 2023. I'll be joining the Snipe Life, and now let's be honest, and leading an 11-day trip through Israel. It is a trip that will change your life. And I'm actually going to be sharing so many more teachings like the ones that you learned today. So if you're interested in this trip, check out the links below where you can learn all of the details about this trip and where you can actually register. Now you can email me at brandon at brandonrobbinsministry.com if you have questions. And while you're at it, if you'd like to have teachings like the ones you learned today delivered to your inbox each month, then just go to brandonrobbinsministry.com where you can sign up and get those for free every month. Thank you so much for watching today. Check out the link right here if you'd like to watch another video that will show you how the Holy Land will transform the way you read the Bible. And until next time, have a great week and God bless.